Greetings my fellow monkey brains. Today we're going to take a look at the difference between back EMF and flyback voltage. Because I've noticed that still online a lot of people are getting mixed up between the two. I'm going to put some timestamps below on this video so you can fast forward to the part about the back EMF. But first we're going to look at flyback voltage. So to look at flyback voltage I've connected up this simple circuit. There's an oscillator and this is a MOSFET driver and it's driving this MOSFET and that directly pulls power through this uh, inductor with several turns on it. Here I'm probing the, uh, the MOSFET drain. Okay, so I've set the power supply to 6 volts which is low for safety. Let me turn on. So this is the voltage on the drain and the MOSFET. Here you can see it's 0 volts which means the MOSFET is conducting but when we reach this point the MOSFET turns off and this high voltage spike is generated which I'm going to zoom into now. So now we're at about 100 volts per division and you can see that we get up to a voltage spike of nearly 400 volts here. This voltage spike is called flyback voltage. Flyback voltage is created whenever the current in an inductive element like this toroid or a transformer is switched off. The reason that the high voltage spike is created is because there's nothing connected at the drain of the MOSFET so the energy in the inductor has nowhere to go when the current is switched off and it simply rams its current into the drain of the MOSFET. This 400 volt spike is quite dangerous and can easily and it will destroy any MOSFET or transistor which is connected if the rating, the voltage rating of that MOSFET or transistor is not high enough. So to get rid of this voltage spike what I'm going to do next is connect a diode, a capacitor and resistor to the drain of the MOSFET and turn this circuit into a basic boost converter and see what it looks like then. So now I've connected a diode, capacitor and resistor to this circuit so now that the current when it comes out of the inductor passes through this wire and through this diode here straight into this capacitor where it's dissipated through this 820 ohm resistor. Now I'm going to switch on the power and we'll take a look at the voltage at the drain of the MOSFET. So here you can see that when the voltage is zero the MOSFET is conducting and then when it switches off it goes high and there's some high frequency ringing here but it only get, reaches about 20 volts peak then it's flat which is when the diode is conducting and transferring energy to the load and then there's some simple oscillation here so this is a basic boost converter if you don't know what a boost converter is I explained it in a previous video which I'll link above so by connecting a diode here to the drain of the MOSFET and allowing somewhere for the energy to go to when it, uh, out of the con inductor we get much, much, much less um, flyback voltage and the energy is transferred into a resistor for dissipation. So next we're going to look at uh, back EMF and uh, I'll have to make up a different circuit for that. Okay, so what is back EMF? Well, back EMF stands for the backwards flowing electromotive force. Electromotive force is basically a voltage and there's three primary ways in which the back EMF can make itself uh, felt. The first way is in motors and generators. Uh, the second way is in a normal transformer, of which I have an example of here. This is just a ferrite toroid with two windings of the same number of turns. And the third way in which back EMF can make itself felt is in a normal inductor with a single winding. But by far the most easiest to explain and understand is the case of the normal transformer. So the normal transformer, I've drawn a diagram here. Of this is my toroid in the middle and it has a primary winding on the left which is connected to a power supply and a MOSFET which I open using a pulse. When the MOSFET opens, current travels through the primary and creates the primary magnetic flux which I've drawn in black and labeled phi P for the primary flux. That primary flux travels all the way around the toroid and penetrates the secondary winding and because of induction generates a voltage in the secondary winding. 
If a current is allowed to flow in the secondary winding, that current will produce its own flux, phi s, and the direction of that flux, which I've drawn in blue, is in opposi opposition to the primary flux. And this is called Lenz's law. Lenz's law states that um, the flux, the direction of flux, which is generated because of induction, will always be in a direction to oppose the flux which created it. So the secondary flux drawn in blue will also travel all the way around the toroid and penetrate the primary rock winding. So the question is, what effect does this secondary flux have on the primary winding? Now, one way to think about this is just to think of induction, that the secondary flux also generates, induces a voltage in the primary winding, but because of Lenz's law, the, that flux will be in opposition to the one which created it, and therefore it will be in the same direction as the primary flux, so it sort of adds to the primary flux. And this has the effect of pulling more current through the primary, because if there's more flux in the primary, there's more current in the primary. The second way to think of the effect of the secondary flux on the primary is to think that it simply reduces the inductance of the primary. And that is because that it, it is in opposition to the primary flux, meaning it has the effect of cancelling the effect of the primary flux, which sort of reduces the inductance. When the inductance is reduced, then more current will flow. Okay, so this is why in a normal transformer, if you apply a power supply and then you short the secondary windings, that will allow a huge current to flow, and then the secondary flux will be huge, and then it will allow a huge current to flow through the primary, which can damage the uh, power supply or the components on the primary side, or blow fuses or whatever. So I'm going to connect this up to the circuit and take a look at it on the scope. So here we are, we've connected up the transformer to the MOSFET and power supply. The yellow probe is looking at the voltage on the drain of the MOSFET and the green probe is looking at the current which is coming through the primary winding. The secondary winding of the transformer is just not connected at all and therefore the secondary has absolutely no effect whatsoever at the moment. I've set to 6 volts here which is quite low, I'm going to turn it on. Okay, pause it. So again, here the yellow is the voltage on the drain and you can see that when the voltage is zero, that's when the MOSFET is conducting. And at that point, the current in the primary is rising linearly, here shown in green. When the MOSFET switches off, there's a large voltage spike. And this is flyback voltage and it's because there's nothing connected on the drain of the MOSFET. Uh, the, after that, the Mos uh, the primary goes into these oscillations here because of residual energy left in the uh, primary. But here you can see that those uh, oscillations are clipped, they won't go below zero, and that's because the body diode in the MOSFET is conducting at that point. It's pulling current from the ground up into the circuit, and you can see that because the current here is partially negative in this region. So now what I'm going to do is turn on the power again, but this time I'm going to short the secondary winding. So I'm going to short the secondary now, and I can do this with my fingers because it's such low power. So immediately you can see the current in green increases massively, and you can also see that the frequency of the yellow oscillations also increases. So I'm going to decrease the, because the current is too big now, I'm going to decrease the uh, setting okay and expand so we can get a better look and then freeze so when I shorted the secondary winding you saw that the current increased massively and I had to reduce the setting to see it properly uh, but you could also see that the oscillations here on the drain of the MOSFET they increased in frequency and that's because we by allowing current to flow in the secondary, the inductance of the primary was reduced. And when the inductance is redu reduced, the frequency of free oscillations will increase. So that is literally a proof that inductance of the primary is reduced because current is allowed to flow in the secondary. 
Okay, so if you like this video, please like and share. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so using the links below. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Please feel free to post below. Thanks a lot.